everyone. This is Larry Stebbins, the Garden Father. I'll be doing a series of podcasts throughout the season, and you'll be hearing about my tips and suggestions and things that I learn along the way. Today we'll be discussing heirlooms, hybrids, and GMOs, and what are the differences, and what are some of the pros and cons. In a nutshell, heirlooms are usually those old-time plants, the ones that have been around for centuries, and hybrids are the cro- is a cross between two, usually heirlooms, uh, of different varieties that can occur in nature but sometimes don't. And GMOs are genetically modified organisms, and that must be done in a laboratory. These are crosses that never could have happened without human intervention. Now let's talk about the heirlooms and many of the many pros of why we want to have heirloom varieties around. You know, those varieties that have been around for centuries. Um, well, they're well suited for the climate zones that they grow in, um, um, and they're, the insects and the other arthropods and critters that have evolved alongside these varieties also are used to those plants, they benefit from those plants, and the plants benefit from them. Um, heirlooms have a great diversity of genetics, too. Um, something like a, a mongrel dog, you know, you, you see these dogs that are a breed of who knows how many different varieties, they tend to have a pretty decent disposition and they tend to be fairly hardy and those are the same things with heirloom plants is they're just a mix of genetics that have been around for a long time and they're suited again for the place in which they grow now there is a fight to preserve these this diverse genetics within the heirloom population of plants and we need to support those efforts to keep these strains and varieties from disappearing from the planet altogether Um, And uh, an an unknown gene, for example, may be present in one of those heirlooms that may become very important to us. For example, if there's a disease or a pestilent bug or something that comes about that could devastate our crops, perhaps there's a gene within that heirloom variety or heirloom varieties that could assist us in uh, warding off that disease or or those pests. Now, what can very well happen is... um, If, for example, all of us want one particular type of vegetable or fruit, and that's the only one we grow because everyone tends to like them, um, then we sometimes forget about keeping those other varieties, those other perhaps heirloom varieties, growing and cultivating because they may not be as profitable in the marketplace. But the genetic material they possess is part of our heritage and I believe should be preserved. Now let's take a look back in history to see when a group of people, a culture, a population depends on just one variety and see what happens. Now I think all of us have heard about this probably in our in, you know in our elementary and middle school age uh, that in 1845 about um, in Ireland there was the beginning of a potato famine. Uh, there was a fungus that was called phyto phylo, let me pronounce this phyto phyora infestans and it spread throughout the potato crop. And in the 1840s, now you gotta remember this, in the 1840s about one half of the Irish population depended on the potato almost entirely for their food. Um, And a potato is quite nourishing by itself. Now according to the Encyclopedia Britannica that stated this, that said that they grew one or two varieties is all that made it more susceptible to diseases. And this one particular disease, this fungus, this, uh, that, that, killed it it was a late blight um, that killed most of the potatoes and about uh, throughout the next few years about a million people died over those next years and over a million left Ireland who because they didn't have the food source and so on to find home elsewhere now in 1840 the population of Ireland was about 8 million Uh, by 1921 now the population never recovered uh, due to the due to the people leaving and due to this, uh, you know, the starvation that happened in the mid-1800s, and the population dropped to about 4 million. Um, now, it stated that mo- that the average Irish person during that time ate over 9 pounds of potatoes a day. Now, I researched this. I couldn't, it's hard to believe that they would eat that many potatoes, but that was their, fo- their sole food source. And, um, and that was about the average throughout the family. Apparently men ate a few more potatoes than the women did at that time as well. Now what's the lesson to be learned here? Well, it's like don't put your eggs or potatoes all in one basket. We need to have the varieties uh, available to us to avert uh, certain catastrophes such as this. 
Now in Peru, even today, there are over 4,000 varieties of potatoes uh, that, are, that are grown in and around the Andean region. Um, all shapes, all colors. Um, it's part of their heritage. They keep them going. Um, now, here's an interesting thing that's going on. McDonald's, you know, the restaurant, for example, needs consistency in their french fries. So they've selected only a few varieties of potatoes that they grow. And they, they actually, you know, pick the farmers, pick where they're going to grow. And, of course, the farmers love this because it's steady income. And McDonald's wants a certain consistent potato to produce a certain consistent fry throughout the country. Now, when they do this, of course, the lesser known varieties of potatoes uh, tend not to be grown, are not as profitable, and hopefully they will not, but they could disappear from the marketplace and disappear altogether if nobody's growing them. So there is a problem with what we call monoculture, growing just one variety throughout time. We need that genetic diversity uh, to help keep us and keep things healthy. Now here's another example. Most of the coffee on this planet is from the Arabica variety of the coffee bean. Almost all of them, that's the most common. Now, you might ask, why does coffee taste so different from one part of the world to another if they're all from very much the similar variety? Well, it's where they're grown. For example, the Arabica coffee that is grown in the volcanic soils of Hawaii tastes a whole lot different than the Arabica coffee bean grown in maybe Sumatra or in India. Uh, it's all where they're grown, and the climate does allow the plant to take on different flavors and different, different aromas as it's grown. But right now, there's a problem with that, because being all of the same variety, one simple infestation could wipe out the Arabica coffee bean from the planet if it was that contagious. Um, now, now, if I haven't convinced you of the need to preserve the different varieties of all these crops, uh, let's talk about another one There's a little more um, uh, hits home. Let's talk about the banana. For years they've been talking about the Cavendish banana being the only variety of banana basically that is marketed around this planet. I mean it's the one that people select for a number of reasons. Um, it just does well, it ships well, uh, ripens after it's picked with a, a simple process that they use. And almost all of the bananas that are grown for, for the export are the Cavendish variety, 99% in fact. And it is susceptible to a fungus um, called the Panama disease, which is a fusarium wilt. It's a wilt, it's a fungus. And uh, if it is not contained, actually it could cause all of the Cavendish bananas to go extinct around the planet. Just a little bit of this infestation in the soil could be transmitted to all the plants that are grown there. So it, it, it is a very big concern right now. Now, uh, will our high-tech labs come up with a genetically modified banana that uh, may fill our niche, and will the public accept it? Well, we'll talk more about that later. So if heirlooms are so important, what are we doing to preserve this genetic mix? Uh, well, uh, let's find out what we can do and what is being done. First of all, you can buy the heirloom varieties that you find in the stores or basically from your local farmer's market and support the local farmers that grow heirloom varieties. And this way, it'll be profitable for them to grow it and uh, you will keep them in business and they'll keep growing those, those crops and preserve that genetic diversity. Um, so please do support that. But you can also, if you don't like the taste of the heirloom varieties, you may wish to donate to the farmers that are, uh, you know, working in the fields and so on that, uh, that are doing this work because it is good work and it is very important. The other thing is we can support seed banks. Now, these are places, um, buildings, if you would say, uh, vaults, as they're sometimes called, that save the varieties of the different seeds, the native seeds around the, around the world, so that future generations can have those seeds, especially in case of a catastrophe. I know we don't like to think about it, but uh, if there was a nuclear uh, um, uh, concern around this planet, hopefully not a war, um, this could really devastate and wipe out certain varieties and then be lost uh, for us forever. Or if climate change really impacts some varieties and they tend to go extinct, by preserving them, perhaps we can save them for future generations when we get the climate uh, more or less in a stable situation. Or if there's some sort of global botanical disease that endangers a certain variety or varieties, 
these seed banks will help preserve those seeds for future use. Now, what are seed banks in particular? Well, they're, you can imagine them just a, uh, like a vault, a, a building that is climate controlled, usually very, very cold, and preserve these seeds for future generations. They hermetically seal them in, in containers and envelopes, and uh, they're there and will stay fairly stable and will be able to germinate years and years to come. There are literally hundreds of seed banks around the world at this time, but one of the best known ones um, is in Svalberg Archipelago, just, uh, which is uh, part of Norway, um, up near the Arctic Circle. And it is inside a mountain in a global seed vault. Yeah, it's a fortress um, built to save these seeds against any natural or man-made disaster. Um, this vault actually can store about four and a half million different varieties of seeds. Uh, and they usually store about 500 seeds per crop, so they have enough that hopefully a few of them will stay viable over the years to come. Uh, but right now they have only have about a million seeds uh, in storage and uh, room for quite a bit more. And most of them are food crop seeds. Uh, the things that we will need, different varieties of wheats and barley and oats and that sort of thing um, that, you know, mankind needs, humankind needs uh, to feed itself in the, in the, in the near and in dis the distant future. Okay, so we talked about why heirlooms are very important, but are hybrids bad? You know, the cross between two, two varieties of plants that possibly could cross in nature without human intervention. Um, are they bad, necessarily? Well, the answer to that, it depends on how you look at that. Um, I say no. Um, I say there's a place for hybrids because these occur in nature no normally, or they can do a little manipulation by humans to cross to bring one plant close to another so that it does pollinate each other, and the resulting seeds then will produce a new variety or a variety that has the best traits of the, the each of the parent plants. Let's talk about some some hybrids that you may be aware of. Snap peas, for example. You know those edible potted peas? Um, they're actually a cross between a snow pea, a flat potted pea, that you can eat the, the pod and the inside smaller pea, and with a shelling pea. Now that shelling pea, you know, has a tough outer pod. You don't eat that. You just eat the peas inside. You know, what you're left with is an edible potted pea that has a large pea in it uh, that, you, that you can eat the whole thing. Another hybrid cross that you may not be familiar with are rutabagas. Some people call them Swedes. It's a cross between a turnip and a cabbage. Very popular in Europe, and they have been for years because they store so long during the winter months. So these are two examples out of the many, many others that we could, could suggest that could naturally occur in nature, but with a little help from, from us, um, have produced a very desirable outcome, a very desirable hybrid that have been enjoyed by so many. One thing to remember is that with most hybrids, you cannot save the seeds like you can with heirlooms because they breed true to their parents. So you can't save the seeds and so you don't get an identical crop to the parent necessarily since it is a mix of the genes of two different varieties of plants in this case. So as you can imagine, each year the farmer has to go out and pollinate with those two ver different varieties to produce seeds of the new hybrid that they wish to have the year following. Now it is worth mentioning that uh, yes, as, as I said, heirloom, you can save the seeds and typically they will produce a plant that is very similar to the parent, but not always. So there's a lot of research out there on how to save seeds from heirlooms uh, and, and do the research. Uh, it's not difficult and you'll be rewarded because those seeds then will produce a variety that you've enjoyed and that next year you'll be able to enjoy again. Okay, that brings us to GMOs, genetically modified organisms. Now, a lot of people say this is just the greatest thing that's ever happened, and other people say, no way, I don't want any GMOs in my food whatsoever. But let's talk about some of the pros and cons. And remember, these GMOs are basically modified organisms, modified that are done, are crosses that would never occur in nature, and they must be done in a lab by manipulating the genes of one variety inside the genes of another variety to produce a variety that never would ever occur in nature. So here are some examples of genetically modified foods. Corn, for example, and by the way, 
quite a bit of our corn, 93% of it is from genetically modified corn, but corn has been genetically modified to contain the gene of a bacteria called Bt or Bacillus thuringiensis, that that bacteria is harmful to caterpillars. Now, one thing that affects corn are corn earworms. It's a caterpillar that, of course, will turn into a, eventually into a moth. Um, but as a caterpillar stage, it will eat the kernels inside the corn before it is fully, uh, fully ripe. But if the corn has this genetically modified gene in it from the BT, then when the caterpillar eats that kernel, it will die. Now, good and bad? Well, good, the farmers don't have to use uh, indiscriminate herbis, uh, pesticides on their crops, spraying it over the field uh, to kill these uh, corn earworms. Um, bad, any caterpillar that eats that corn will die. So it doesn't just affect the corn earworm, it could affect any one of the things, the moths or butterfly caterpillars that may indiscriminately find their way to that corn kernel or perhaps that ingest some of the pollen from that corn that's been genetically modified. So, you know, here's, here's something that you need to concern yourself with. What is the peripheral damage that can be done by genetically modified organisms that may seem harmless and it may seem like a benefit to mankind, humankind, but is it really? No, there are some reports that up to about 60% of the processed foods that you find in the grocery stores are made from some GMOs or genetically modified organisms. You know, quite of the things that contain corn, corn starch, soy, soy products, and so on, uh, could be modified so that they grow um, in the fields to protect the plant against something. For example, uh, indiscriminate spraying of herbicides. Maybe you make something where the plant can withstand being sprayed by a harmful chemical so that it'll kill the weeds around it but won't kill that plant. Now, is that necessarily good for us too? Well, the debate is still out there and the research shows that it is inconclusive at this point. But here's one thing that is not inconclusive, uh, is this is a big concern, and it's food allergens, and that is a big concern. You know, the, the, the grower does not have to, the person in the lab does not have to divulge their secrets as far as what genes were inserted into another organism. They consider it a trade secret, and right now it seems to be protected so that we may not know. But let's just say that uh, you wanted to put in a gene from a peanut plant into a certain plant so that it would act like a peanut. And peanut, as some of you know, uh, their roots can sequester atmospheric nitrogen in through their nodules through a relationship with the bacteria in the soil so that it can actually self-fertilize, produce its own nitrogen fertil fer fertilizer. What if you are uh, allergic to, uh, to peanuts? and that gene is, uh, is in that food and you don't know it and you eat it unknowingly, as some of you may know, a peanut allergy can be severe and can cause death quite quickly if it's not tended to. Now another thing is some people have uh, an allergy to gluten or they're celiacs and cannot, uh, cannot tolerate gluten in their diet. What if some of that gluten protein is in a food that you may not know about and you have a reaction and you're just getting sicker and sicker and you don't know why? Well, these are some of the main concerns about adding some genetically modified organisms uh, and, and allowing them to be used just indiscriminately through the food industry. Do we really know what we're eating? And are those things good or bad for us? And what do we do for those people that are susceptible to allergens uh, that are in the food that aren't labeled? A very, very big concern. Now, here are some, uh, some of the weirdest GMOs, uh, genetically modified organisms, that I've come across. See, it doesn't always happen just in plants. It can be in animals as well. They have now made a glow-in-the-dark animal. Um, now, there's reasons for that for research, and I won't go into the details on that. But uh, the genes that were spliced from an insect, like a firefly, into that animal, and the animal actually does glow in the dark, much like that firefly does uh, that you see out on a, on a, on a night uh, in, in during the summer. They've also found out that they can make glow-in-the-dark trees. Now here's an interesting, someone came up with the idea that we could light our cities at night by just making genetically modified trees and putting them throughout our city so they glow in the dark so we wouldn't need as many street lights. Uh, something to think about. Now here's another one, venomous cabbage. Yeah, I, you heard right, venomous cabbage. In other words, what they've done is they've tried to splice some genes from a scorpion from the venom of a scorpion into a cabbage so that any insects eating that cabbage could possibly die after they eat it. 
But what about those folks that uh, could get an anaphylactic shock reaction uh, from the venom? Uh, you know, you've heard of people with bee stings and so on. Not everyone can ward off a bee sting and, uh, and just have it be an uncomfortable situation. Some of them can actually go into shock and it could, could cause, uh, cause death if not uh, treated properly. And another, how about a web spinning goat? Yeah, um, a goat that could actually produce spider silk. Uh, in its in its milk, in other words, uh, protein ver that you could uh, uh, extract from the milk to make uh, spider silk. Now, people who've done their research know that spider silk is a very very strong and lightweight material. I mean, for its size, and it is it it is quite an amazing bit of material. So, what if you could get goats to manufacture that uh, by genetically modifying them by putting some of the spider genes inside a goat? Now the list is endless, and of course uh, scientists all over the world now are um, are experimenting and just to seeing what they can come up with. But as a society, we have to decide: Are we willing to accept these? Are we willing to release these? Uh, uh, some people call them Franken foods, Franken monsters, Franken you know animals into into the wild. Could they populate and produce things that we may not be aware of? Uh, these are the things that I think are important discussions to have. You know, they haven't been uh, culled out by evolution. They're things that would be new in the environment. Could we produce uh, certain organisms that would have no predators and therefore multiply quite quickly and have another poor effect on our, our environment? You know, again, when we start messing with the, uh, with the ecology of an area, we have to deal with all the ramifications that may come up. But I touched on this a little bit. Probably the biggest concern I have right at the very moment is the G GMO technology that has been used to produce, uh, that is used in the grain and, and feed crop industry. And they're trying to work this out and to find how they can genetically modify grains and food crops so that they will be resistant to herbicides. So a farmer could spray his fields and kill off all the things he doesn't want growing there and just leave the wheat, barley, or oats growing. Well, the thing is those herbicides will be or will be present in that in the in the wheat and in the barley and the oats when it's harvested, is that what we want in our food? I you know I vote no on this, um, and I think we need to do a lot more research and walk very very gently as we use GMOs. Well, there you have it in a nutshell: a comparison of heirlooms, hybrids, and genetically modified organisms, and in this case, plants. There's a lot more that needs to be discussed. Um, now listen, as always, if you have any comments, pros or con, um, you know, um, I'm, I, I, I like to welcome them. Let's continue the dialogue as we move forward. Well, this is Larry the Garden Father signing off. Happy gardening!